All right, what's up, everybody? This is going to be a crash course in futures trading, futures contracts. Um, Don is planning on putting a course on futures in his trading suite at some point. I feel like that's one of the things that he's been meaning to work on it for a while, and it hasn't really happened. And I'm like, well, I'm going to teach something. So I'm going to do a crash course on futures. Try to make this as quick and painless as possible. There are probably better produced things on YouTube. In fact, I know there are. That's how I learn them. But for anybody in the chat that for some reason feels like listening to me talk about things, uh, you're going to learn some future stuff. So we're going to cover futures trading. What are futures contracts? How do you actually understand the ticker symbol? Understanding what tick value and point value are and how risk management gets tied directly into that. Understanding futures margin requirements, how to use that to your advantage and some of the potential disadvantages of the highly leveraged nature of futures contracts. And then just as a personal aside, how I use zones and how I have TradeStation integrated through TradingView and how I use that as my chart trading platform uh, if I'm sitting at my desk trading futures. Um, if that's what you're really interested in doing, by the way, I'm not the right person to talk to because I am very rarely ever sitting at my desk trading. It's just not a reality. I work an outside sales job. I'm, I'm on the road. I'm doing things. Um, so if you're looking for an in-depth tutorial on that, uh, sorry, I'm not going to be of any value to you. So first of all, what are futures contracts? Um, picture Farmer Bob. Farmer Bob is growing corn, and he's like, man, they're, the corn prices, uh, they, they just keep going up and up and up, um, but I think we're going to see a drought, I think something's going to happen, and I'm really concerned that these corn prices are just going to plummet at some point, and I'm Farmer Bob, I need to make my living via selling corn, and so I'm really concerned that I'm not going to be able to sell it for as much a couple months from now as I am right now in the current marketplace. And then just across the street, there's a factory that produces sugar corn pop cereal, and they're like, man, the corn prices keep going up, it's hurting our bottom line, hurting our profit margins, it's really starting to get to us. I'm really concerned that corn prices are going to continue going up in the future, and I need some way of protecting myself from that. And so Farmer Bob and the manufacturer of sugar corn pop cereal strike a deal that, say, three months from now, Farmer Bob is going to sell corn at such and such a value, and sugar corn pop cereal is going to purchase that corn at such and such a value in the future. That is basically how futures contracts work. In this instance, Farmer Bob would be the seller, Sugar Corn Pop Cereal would be the buyer, and that's how it's going to go down. Um, so futures actually got their start in the agricultural industry and then branched out pretty dramatically from there. You can still trade futures contracts that are tied to agricultural things such as corn, soybean, wheat, um, coffee, sugar. I don't believe they're nearly as liquid as some of the other futures that we're going to be taking a look at here. Uh, wood is another one. Wood futures went crazy a year ago, or was it a year ago? Something like that. So uh, there are futures contracts for a ton of different things. In the past, when you held these futures contracts and you held them through their expiration period, because they're, they're contracts that have an expiration date, uh, you would be required to either deliver the product that you sold via this futures contract or you would be required to receive the product that you bought via this futures contract so futures contracts are a little bit different than options contracts where options contracts give you the right but not the obligation to have uh to put your sh uh, put your shares on somebody or something like that um so you, you have the right but not the obligation to exercise your options contract versus a futures contract, you are actually obligated to receive or to sell the product that you are, your, whichever side of the exchange that you're on for futures trading. Most futures trading that you're going to take place in through most brokers such as uh, Thinkorswim or that's TD Ameritrade, uh, TradeStation, AMP Futures, um, Ninja Trader, they're all going to be cash settled, which means you don't have to worry about taking physical delivery of any products. So that's one less thing to worry about with your trading. So that's what futures contracts are. It's an agreement 
to have an exchange at an agreed upon price at a future date. Now, if you've ever looked at futures contracts, you realize that they have this really funky naming scheme. Part of that comes down to you've got the, the root of the uh, futures contract. So we're going to go ahead and pull up TradeStation's website here. And so you have the symbol root right here. Um, the E-mini S&P 500 is probably the most well-known. If you uh, follow Don's trading at all, uh, let me pull up my trading view. Let's let's load Don's charts, or at least the most recent version I have. When Don is looking at uh, SPX 500 USD, he's looking at the contract for difference. Uh, that's not quite a futures contract. There's something different. You can't trade them legally in the United States. But um, this is, for all intents and purposes, the exact same thing as... Um, the E-mini futures contract, ES. The big difference here is the CFD data, at least within TradingView, is free versus, I forget how I got the data for futures in TradingView. I'm wondering if it's because I have a broker linked or something like that. Um, either way, CFDs tend to be free. So when he's looking at this, he's really looking at the CFD equivalent of ES. And so if you were to go to Thinkorswim and wanted to look things up, you would go slash, come on Thinkorswim, slash ES. Slash is what designates a futures contract within Thinkorswim. Uh, in TradingView, it's a little bit different. You just type the, the root and then whatever comes after it that we're going to talk about in a second. So there you have it. That would be pulling up ES within Thinkorswim. That is the S&P 500 E-mini contract. Um, and as you can see, there's a whole plethora of futures contracts that you can trade. There are futures for indexes. There are futures for bitcoins, bitcoins for futures for Bitcoin. There's futures for currencies. Uh, I have no idea what Euro next lift is. Um, there's more currencies. There's interest rates. There's metals, energies, agricultural meats, softs, which are coffee, cotton, frozen, orange juice has its own future contract. I'm going to go ahead and take a guess that that is not liquid at all. Um, and then there's lumber in there as well. So there you have it. Those are the root symbols that you'll need to know if you want to go about trading a futures contract. But what you'll notice is that when you go to uh, pull up a symbol, so let's say I'm going to trade the micro contract of the S&P 500, which is MES. Let's click Trade Station here so it helps me narrow things down. And let's click Futures so that I actually can sort through this properly. Here's MES, we'll click the little drop down arrow. And now we have an MES M2022, MES U2022, Z2022, H2023, I'll bet that has no liquidity. Um, so you can see there's the root, there's a random letter, and then there's a year. In this instance, it spells it out for you the M is the expiration for June of 2022. If we go back to our uh, trade station page, by the way, oops, sorry, um, the CME group, which is part of who makes futures contracts, uh, they list all of the expirations here. You don't really need to have these memorized. I don't have them memorized. Um, I see no value in it. You do need to uh, know which month you're going to be trading, though, because if I go back to trading view, and uh, let's let's look at the June contract right here, and let's pull up another chart, and we're going to do uh, MESU 2022. You'll notice that they're actually trading at different prices right now. So these are the, uh, what was the MESU? Um, that's the September expiration versus the June expiration, which will be rolling around soon. Uh, and let's let's uncheck volume just to see what that's going on like right now uh there's 707 in volume there and right there there's uh that's 336,000 so we have significantly more volume going through the June expiration cycle it's the closer one than we have for the September cycle and like I said there's actually a slight difference in price between the contracts 
This has come back to bite me before. I was entering an order real quick on TradeStation, uh, had to run into a customer, so I was kind of in a hurry. And it was like a type two short position, stop was real tight. I entered my trade, hit send, pocketed my phone, and in the process of pocketing my phone, did not realize that I had received a notification. I had traded the wrong contract month, the wrong expiration month, and so my trade had actually gone through, the market order was valid, and my stop was like just above where that month was actually uh, trading, so it popped up a little bit, I, sh I stopped that on my short position for like a $3 loss or something dumb like that, and then it came right on down and I missed out on a very profitable trade. So knowing your expiration month is going to be really important when you go to actually put these things into your phone. Um, if you're trading that way or if you're trading on the desktop platform, whatever you're going to do, you need to know your expiration month. Um, so I, for example, I know if I'm going to be trading contracts right now, uh, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, the Russell, the Dow, they're all going to be on the June expiration cycle right now. So if I'm going to trade the Russell, it's M2KM 2022. And here's the June expiration cycle for the Russell micro future contract. Okay. So speaking of micro futures contracts, we've talked about what are futures contracts. We've talked about reading the ticker. Oh, if you haven't figured it out, um, that 2022 at the end is the year of the expiration. So you have your route, your month, your year. I really hope that's easy enough to figure out. When you go to enter these in a platform like uh, TOS, if I was going to trade MES, it's going to be MES M22. It's not 2022, it's 22. I don't know why TradingView has to be difficult like that. TradeStation is the same way. It's MES M22 instead of 2022. Um, so that's that's a helpful thing to know. But really, if you're having trouble finding the futures contract you want, at least on uh trading view just start typing mes you know the route it's going to show you that you click your little drop down and you can go select the date that's how i did it when i first started learning um thinkorswim users i feel like that functionality exists let's let's find out slash mes as mes h23 m22 i don't know why that one's first ah okay and one final thing that some of you guys are probably going to be asking about um you could ask well why don't you just trade the mes that doesn't have a month because look you have all of this historical data right um that is a way that brokers allow you to do your charting so trading view has the same thing when you do mes one with an exclamation point this is they call it the continuous contract or sorry it's the current contract in front continuous so you can go back as far as you want to go and it's going to be all of the data for whatever the next expiration cycle is and then that data is going to get bumped over when the when that one expires and the next one comes into play so mesm is the june cycle once that data is done and we hit june 16th is the expiration date it's going to kick over to mesm or mesh and then the data is going to reflect those numbers. You cannot trade a continuous contract. There is no such thing. Every futures contract you trade has an expiration date. So this is really helpful for charting. It's not so helpful for actually trading. Um, and the this should be the same as if it's the next contract in front, MESM 2022. Yeah, the prices are the same. So you can do your charting here, know where your stop is going to be if you're in a position, and then do the exact same trade on the most current expiration cycle. So we've we've stuck on that long enough. Sorry, but that is those that's all important stuff that you need to know if you want to trade futures. Uh, so we've talked about how to read the ticker futures. Um, now let's understand tick value and risk management. Futures move in increments called points. So when we look at the micro S&P 500 contract, uh, it is currently worth 4,136.75 points. That is not dollars, that is points. It moves in increments called ticks. So the smallest possible movement that MES can have is one tick. And that one tick is, let's go, let's get down to a small time frame. We'll really zoom it in. 
one tick is going to be worth, I believe it should be 0.25. So there we go. There's one tick. And I, I just used the measuring tool to measure out one tick. When you use the measuring tool in trading view, by the way, so you hold shift and you click on the chart and you drag and it's going to have um, the, the measurement bar come up just like I did. It's going to show you your ticks on the right and your points on the left. Super helpful because that tells you one tick is the equivalent of a quarter point on the micro S&P 500 futures contract. You need to know the tick value of any of these because that's going to help you determine your risk. And that can be done primarily just by Googling it. I thought I had an example up. Oh, there we go. So I typed in MES tick value. The dollar value of one tick for MES is $1.25 per contract. So for every contract you owe, you either are long or short, um, it's going to move $1.25. So that one tick is worth $1.25. Uh, that means one point is worth $5. And so if you were like me and my my short position today, where did I have my stop originally? I don't remember. It came down into this zone and I was just feeling cheeky. So I decided to, to grab a contract. Um, and so if we use our long tool right here, I probably, I grabbed it. Well, I grabbed it. Oops. I grabbed it right where that line is. And then it was somewhere down here. Um, I don't remember if I did something like that. So that risk right there, if we measure from top to bottom, that is 19.5 points. If it's $5 per point, 19.5 times $5 is $97.50 risk for that one move. That's going to be super important to understand when it comes to trading these. Also because every futures contract is going to have a slightly different tick value. So if we go up here and we say MNQ tick value, MNQ is going to move 50 cents per contract versus the uh, S&P 500, the MES, which means MNQ, oh, sorry. If I would have grabbed that one at the end of the day, uh, which I did not, I don't trade M&Q much because as you can see, it's worth a whole lot more points, which means a smaller move is worth a ton of points. Right here, that would be 96.75 points with a tick value of 50 cents. I mean, let's just operate off that 387, 387 times 0.5. That's $193 risk. Right there, that tiny little move. Well, that is a four hour candle, but still. Um, so that thing will move like crazy. M2K, which is the Russell index. I actually prefer trading the Russell or the Dow because it's worth less points, which means that move, if you were to grab that here, grab that here, it's still, uh, M2K is still only 50 cents per tick, which means it's $2 per point because it's four ticks per point. That's another thing I probably should have said and forgot to do. If I had a spreadsheet or something, this would be easier, but I'm just doing this as I ramble along. Um, 112 ticks times 50 cents is $56 that you would risk right there. So you can see the risk is much smaller for the same style move that I just measured out on each of them. And Grandpa Dow um, is, what did I do? Is M Y oh M Y M is the Dow and then I need another M is the expiration. So there you go. There's Grandpa Dow, and if we measured out, you know that's that same style trade. Um, that's 187 points. That's 93 and a 93.5 .5, 93 and a half dollars risk. I'm losing. I'm losing my brain. It's 9:30 at night. That's like my bedtime. Anyways, so that's that's uh, how you measure the movement on these. On Thinkorswim, for those of you that are still using that, you can pull up your trend line tool, and this is MES. So we go here and click and drag, and uh, that's telling us that that is. I actually don't know what that is. Oh, it allows you to measure in non non point values or non non even 
So like right now it's 99.8 points. MES cannot move 99.8 points because it can only move in uh, 0.25 increments. One tick is 0.25 points. It's a quarter point. So you're never going to see a 0.58. So it's kind of weird that it allows you to measure like that. But TOS is weird. So that's how you measure that. I personally recommend if you're going to trade, you know, the uh, S&P 500. I came in, I grabbed this. Where'd my zones go? Oh, never mind. Um, I came in, I grabbed this, and you can see I actually have a, a position on this. I grabbed it at the very bottom, and my risk was measured out, and the way that I measure it is by the long tool on Thinkorswim, which you can access over here on this little button right here above the thumbs up. There's a long position and a short position. So we're going to do a long position. Let's say you were going to grab this knife because you predicted it somehow. Um, double click on it and you can tell it to risk in dollars or percent of your overall account. I like to just do dollars and let's say I want to risk $100 per trade. That is uh, 0.87. So that would actually be more than $100 risk. So I'd have to bring it in tighter and there's one. So I'm risking $100 there and you can bring it in. That's telling you the number of uh, contracts you can buy, by the way, that middle number there. And this is your risk to risk to reward ratio. And so if I were grabbing a super tight position and only risking $100, I could grab two contracts where I'm only risking 10 points. I'm stopping out at 10 points with two contracts. That's going to risk $100. So uh, I hope that makes sense. I use the long position tool or the short position tool like these measuring tools. You can see I, I, I have them saved in my favorites. I use them religiously because they help me make smart decisions and manage my risk properly. Um, so like, let's let's look at MES up here, right? I was kicking myself for not taking this trade, but I haven't been as involved in futures trading lately. Um, let's say you were gonna grab the type two and you were just gonna put your stop up here. And if I'm gonna risk $200, I could grab 1.6 contracts. So in this instance, I would probably just grab one. I would risk less than $100 and see if I could get a move on a four hour time frame on futures which if you do, you know, you catch a zone to zone move like that on futures, uh, that's a 152, right? Is that 152.5 points? Yeah, in or about. So 150 points at $5 a point, because I can't do basic math, I'll pull up my calculator, that's $750 in one zone to zone move. Uh, one contract will move like crazy. So that brings me to the next point of talking about this is margin requirements. You could say, wow, one contract and I can make $700 on one zone to zone move. Uh, how much money does it take to actually do this? If we go back to our TradeStation website, it's going to tell us about our intraday initial margin, our maintenance margin, our overnight margin, and then there's a maintenance margin again. I don't know why that's there. So the one that I really care about is overnight, by the way. So you'll see that your initial margin is the amount of money that is that you have to have in your account to put this trade on. Every broker is different in this way because they can set their own initial margin. TradeStation has it set at about 25% of your overnight margin, I believe. And they've changed their margin rates too. Oh, wow. They've changed them pretty dramatically. I didn't know that. So right now they're, they're, oh, well, and it has it right here. Their intraday rates about 50%. It used to be a lot lower than that. The markets got more volatile. So they started requiring people to have more money in their accounts. Um, so TradeStation in my experience is one of the higher ones. Uh, what that initial margin means, and that's your, that's your day trade margin rate. That means that in order to put on one of these contracts and only have it during regular market hours, you're not holding it overnight. You're not holding it. There's like a one hour period where futures are closed. Um, you have to have $616 in your account. That's it. To, to give you um, to give you some perspective, one MES contract is roughly the equivalent of 50 shares of SPY. So SPY right now is worth 413.35 times 50. That's about 
little under $21,000 of market exposure that you gain by having $616 free in your account. Your intraday margin is going to dictate uh, how long you have before your broker gives you a margin call and shuts down your position. So if you only have $1,000 in your account and you bag hold a future contract the wrong direction, you're going to get a nasty letter from TradeStation saying, all right, we need to shut this thing down once your account reaches this threshold. Your overnight margin is the amount of money that you have to have in your account to hold this position overnight. As you can see, right now our, our day, our, or sorry, our initial margin rate is 50%, so it's about $1,200, and you get to hold this contract overnight. So that move that we saw, oh, what did I just do? That move that we saw on uh, MES right here would have taken about one day to complete. You would need to have about $1,300 in your account to potentially make that $700 move if you played zone to zone. So with $1,300, you can make $700. That's, what, over 50% of your whole account? As you can see, futures allow you to do some incredibly risky things. And that's where I really need to emphasize here, risk management is key when it comes to trading futures um, because they are unforgiving. You do not want to bag hold one of these in the wrong direction. Let's say you bought at the peak right here, right? Uh, we, we got that. Well, let's let's use the flip side as the example here. Let me clear that out so I can actually see. The market's going up, market's going up, market's going up, and you're like, man, we're seeing a breakout right here. I think we're breaking out. I need to get in long, and I'm just going to bag hold this thing. We're going back to all-time highs, right? Because lo look at the margin it created, guys. Where's all-time highs is right there. If I get in, I can't even see my candles anymore. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> if I get in right now, it's pushing up, and we go back to all-time highs. That's a 493-point move. Uh, one contract's going to get me about $2,500 profit. So I'm just going to load up on this thing, right? And you ride that one contract all the way down from here to here. You are now down 171 points. You're down $855. Now, if you're willing to risk $855 on a trade, I mean, more power to you. Um, that's a little bit steep for my taste just yet. Some of you are, you know, you're at a higher capital level than I am. That's perfectly fine. Um, I typically try to risk about $100 to $200 per trade trading futures. That's just me. And that also requires me to keep my stops really tight and to make sure that I know the direction that I'm trading. And it also limits the futures contracts I can trade. The S&P 500? It's a little bit expensive for me. That's why I said I really I really need to learn to type. I really like the Russell. Because the Russell is moving so much less that if we went if we if we grab top to bottom there, that's two hundred oh oh wait, what's our tick value? Our tick value is fifty cents, so it's two six seven one times point five. That's about thirteen hundred dollars right there. Um from that huge move that takes several days to occur. This is the daily chart. It's it's just more forgiving. You have more leeway, um, especially, you know, if I have my risk and I, I got in at that, like, imagine not buying at the bottom zone when it was down here. And I did this a couple of times, actually. Um, and let's say I'm risking $200. Eh, that's going to be a little bit over 200 So I'd probably pull it in tighter and have to babysit it a little bit. Boop. There, right about there. Be where I stop out. And then you can capture, I mean, even a move right to there, you're making almost three times your risk on that on a very small margin. The margin rate on the Russell as of right now is, why can't I find the Russell? RTY, no, M2K, the, the overnight margin rate is $600. So for $600, you can have that kind of market exposure. All right, you can't really beat that. Um, so that's point value, tick value, and margin requirements. The really interesting thing about margin requirements, like I said earlier, is that every broker can actually set it for themselves. And so you run into some brokers, uh, well, let's just go to Google and type in futures trading. And Ninja Trader is one of the first ones that comes up, right? They're apparently a really good platform. I don't know. I downloaded it to play with it. They don't have a mobile app, so it's useless to me. Um, their intraday margin rate, $50 margin for micros. 
that's what we've been looking at this whole time, right? $50 margin for micros, that's your initial margin. Your overnight margin is still going to be that, that 1,200, 1,300 number that we saw in TradeStation. I believe that's set by the regulatory bodies that, that control the markets. Um, but that $50 margin, I mean, if you got $500 in your account, you could have 10 contracts. Uh, well, 500, you could have one e-mini contract. And you want to you want to talk about money moving around. Let's look at ES. That's the e-mini contract. That is worth $12.50 per point, which means uh, from market open to market close today, we moved... There's 115, 116, we're just going to round it to 116 points. 116 times 12.5, that one contract is going to move $1,450. So that stuff moves around really, really, really quick. Uh, if you tried to buy here and just bag held until here, I mean, you're you're bankrupt. Um, so margin requirements make a big difference in futures trading. Like I said, it is highly leveraged. Um, so why trade it? Like you're like, well, is that really safe uh, with the stop loss in place? Yeah, it's, it's pretty doable. Um, there's other things that we could talk about making sure you're monitoring your orders that I don't have as much time to get into. Don has already talked about that a lot. Um, generally speaking, you do not want to be in a futures position where you don't have a stop loss in place. And, um, that's, I mean, that's just a really, I would say, important role in understanding futures trading, uh, because if you you're on the wrong side of this trade and you just ride this thing down, like I said, you're you're hurting right now. You're down nearly a thousand dollars in one day uh, if you didn't stop out. Um, so having stops in place is going to be important. Um, the benefit is you have a ton of market exposure with a very little min amount of capital. Uh, for some traders, that can can be a big thing for them. For some traders, that could absolutely ruin them because they're just irresponsible with margin. So it really comes down to understanding yourself as a trader and who you are um, and not doing something completely reckless. Um, oh, there was something else I wanted to say in regards to that. Well, that thought has left my mind. So... Moving on, uh, how I use zones. As you can see, I have done all of my charting on the continuous contract that TradingView offers. Um, I drew these zones myself because Don isn't zoning up the, uh, the features contracts. And I still zone them out on, and once again, this is personal taste for me, by the way, just throwing that out there. Um, I zone these things out on the four hour and on the hourly. Really, I've been doing the daily and like grabbing wicks. When you grab wicks on the daily, it tends to translate over, in my experience, to the four hour pretty well. Uh, I'm not so certain about this middle area, but I want to watch that. So like what I'm looking at right now, right? We pushed up. I did not short because I, have, I haven't been trading futures. I need to get back into it. Um, I've been busy. And by the way, that's that's one of the things that makes futures difficult is how quickly it can move. Like one contract can move hundreds of dollars. Um, you tend to have to babysit these things. And the other added benefit, by the way, is that there is no PDT rule. So with a $5,000 account, you can be in and out of futures contracts all day. Uh, once again, for some traders, that can be really helpful. For some traders, that could be their downfall. if They just overtrade and throw all their money away. Um, but like a, a situation like that, where you got a nice wick to the upside, um, now, this one wouldn't have been as problematic. I'd probably be watching the hourly, right? We come up, we hit that type two. And I've learned with futures trading, if I want to hit that type two, I want to have my stop. Let's see, I, I probably would have put my stop there because of this wick right here. You hit the type two, your order fills. And um, Don likes to do the 15 minute in and out game. I don't tend to have a lot of time for that. Um, so like as soon as it's in the green, he's moving to stop in the green. That wick would have tagged you out right there. And I've seen that happen so many times that it just gets aggravating. So I I still I really try to stick by the hourly time frame actually. And so we you know get a nice move down here. We got this Doji candle here. That was after the uh, the market close. There's a one hour period during the day where um, where the futures markets are closed, and then it opens back up. We had a gap down. This candle formed. Uh, I actually thought about going long right here just for the little ride up and didn't do it. Um, I would have had my stop right there, gotten tagged out by this candle, and had I been watching it today, it would have been an excellent opportunity to short, right? 
So on that trade right there, I could have made, had I actually played this, um, math, 30, 35.75 points times if I had two contracts, that'd be a $350 move. Really though, I said I would have had one contract on there, so that would have been a $178 winner. Um, just in, you know, a couple of hours. Oh, sorry, these are, these are hourly candles? Yeah, hourly candles. Um, the downside is that's going to require you to be in and out and be paying more attention to the hourly charts, to the 15-minute charts, to whatever time frame you feel comfortable with. I don't have the time during the day to be looking at those smaller time frames. There's, there's days that I'm on the road for hours at a time. Um, when you're in a position and you're, like, there's some days, uh, today would have been a great example a candle like this, here's here's another weird thing that I've noticed, and I'm, I'm getting off on tangents at this point. Sorry, this is going to be a long video, but um, I've noticed that like you'll get these pushes, push up overnight, right? We had a we had a drawdown that day. We got a push up overnight. We're retesting the zone from the bottom. These are some of my favorite moments to look at getting in long or short, depending on what it's doing. Um, I like to short the markets a lot when this happens. You'll get that weird push up. It's just a low volume overnight. This is 8 o'clock in the evening, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, right? It's pushing up, pushing up, pushing up. I would have first gotten a chance to look at it at, well, there's 5 o'clock in the morning. Probably missed the train right there. Um, if I was going to trade it, I'd have my stop right there. But then we got this weird push up. First thing in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, it's pushing. I love it when it does that. I've learned that I, I will wait until 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning to trade futures. Um, even though you can trade them basically around the clock, that you get that one strong move where it's like low volume. They're trying to convince everybody that, yeah, now's the time to do it, right? There's 161,000 on volume, 200,000, 131. Actually, that's not super low. Well, it feels like low volume to me. So uh, I misspoke there. That technically is not low volume, but you get that nice push up. I would short that right there. Short that. Like, as soon as we're retesting that zone, we start retesting this little grouping right here. Have my stop right there. I could afford two contracts for a $200 risk. And uh, I would probably be aiming for this bottom right here, depending on what's going to happen, and then just trail it. And on hourly candles, we get a nice down move like this. Uh, that would probably freak me out. I'd probably switch to the 15 minute. See that candle. See that candle. Momentum is starting to slow down. I would have my stop right there and probably get tagged out on this candle right before the push up and the continuation. But you're still looking at be a, over a $400 winner. Um, definitely a possibility, trading futures contracts. Um, so that's how I utilize zones. It's a lot of price action, a lot of what Don teaches. Um, some days you have it and you're making money. Some days you're just fighting the market and it, you know, you think gap and crap on a Friday and it just runs up. And uh, I've, I've learned that... Um, I will take two losses trading futures and then I'm done for the day. Um, if I'm not on it directionally, I'm just not on it. I won't count break evens at that because there is no PDT. If I get in a position and bump myself to break even and it comes back and tags me and I get back in, uh, that's that's just a scratch trade. But if I take a loss, I'm losing you know $100, $200. Uh, I'll take that loss one more time and then decide that's, that's it for me. So personally, that's how I'm uh, managing this. And when I am at my desk, I like to use TradeStation integrated with TradingView. Um, you can pull up the bottom panel here. I'm not going to pull that up because that has my account information in it. Um, but it allows you to utilize the the long or short position tool that we've been talking about. Oops, I didn't want to delete that. That's the position I'm in. Um, but like, let's say you wanted to get in. And like I said, you double click it. You set the amount that you want to risk. Um, $100 risk, and we right-click, and I don't know if this is going to show my account information. I think that might show my account information, but you can right-click and do... Okay, I can't demonstrate it right now. Um, you click here, and I actually have to switch over to my futures account. Right now, it's on my stock account, but it's integrated through TradingView. When you right-click on this, there will be an option that says Create Limit Order, and it will bring up the ordering screen, which, as you can see, I'm not logged into the right account to do that, so I have to go switch accounts in this pane right here. Um, it'll show you how much you're risking, what percent you're risking, what dollar value you're risking, where your stop loss is. You enter that trade, and uh, that's how you 
trade these futures contracts. It's going to look very similar to what position was I in? I'm not in Tesla, am I? What? I thought there was a position I was in. I was going to show you. It'll show you the lines on here where your stop loss and your take profit are and everything like that. I don't remember um, what position I'm in right now, so that's not going to be of any help to anybody. But um, Oh, Neo. I'm short Neo. I am not logged into the right account to demonstrate that. Well, <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, so you'll have your stop loss and your, your take profit on the screen here, and you can actually just drag that stop loss right around just like you can on the TradeStation mobile app. So that's how I like to trade futures when I'm at my desk or trade stocks for that matter. I can right-click on the chart and enter the order right there. If not, I've found that for being on the road and doing what I do, uh, TradeStation has the best mobile app. I do not like Thinkorswim's futures trading. I think it's a pain in the butt. Um, plus, their commissions are way higher. Uh, trade stations like 25 cents uh, per contract, and then there's the regulatory fees. So it's about a dollar 25 round trip per contract for the micros. So the the full size futures are worth more, but um, you know your commission, they don't, they'll add up over time. But uh, compared to the the movements that you'll see and the amount you can make or lose on those movements, the the commissions don't really mean anything. So. Sorry for this being so long-winded. I hope this has been a good crash course in futures. Uh, if you're in Don's group, that's probably how you found this video. If you have questions, hit me up in Discord. My name is Zach in Discord. Um, you should be able to find me in there, and I'm happy to answer anything that I didn't make clear enough in this video. So if you made it this far, thanks for watching. Have a great evening, day, morning, whatever you're doing, wherever you are. <laughs>